Hey everybody, good to see you back once again. So we're approaching the final hurdle of the old tri-build and well, I'm confident if we can clear this one, it'll be smooth sailing from this point on. But I am gonna warn you, we're going off the rails a bit with this episode. So heck, let's not even sugarcoat it. The bus doesn't stop where we're about to go, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but I've had an idea that's been living in my brain for a few years and I need to try and turn that into reality because I'm pretty sure everything's gonna work. and. We'll probably have a more solid starting engine set up for the D2 and D4 platform anyway. After I do the modification that I want to do to this, then what we have with the current factory design. So I'll show you what I'm thinking. We have this block here. It is the later 5F series. And remember now, I mentioned at the beginning of the Tri-Build series, this was the one that I was going to show you what you can get away with on. So there is some good, there is some bad, uh, but I'll show you why this one is the perfect test subject to do what I want to do. So the good, none of the water jackets have been frozen and cracked. That's very good. We have some clean, freshly honed, 20 thousandths oversized original bores, never had to be sleeved. That's good. We have good valve seats. That's a good aspect of it. Probably one of the better aspects of it, we have a front main bearing bar that's never had a bearing loosen up and spin. That's all true. So we have factory finish on that. That boring job there so those are all very very good attributes now for the bad this engine has suffered some trauma in a past life so I'll guide you guys in here you can see a little bit better that chunk that's been knocked out of the bottom of the cylinder wall that was from a connecting rod trying to move further than it had room to move and we have an accompanying witness mark with a noticeable dent in the floor of the crankcase and looking a little further into it you can see the discoloration on this copper oil drain tube. So that's where the oil line was right there. So everything below that was a little bit cooler, but at the top of the oil line on up, there was enough heat to actually blue that copper and, and discolor it a bit. So a lot of friction was taking place inside this crankcase. And I'm 99% sure that can be traced back to fuel getting down into the oil. So in layman's terms, the oil didn't have enough slick factor left in it and the film that separates all of your metal parts from one another while this thing is spinning around goes away you start having metal on metal contact and it starts building heat through friction and typically the connecting rod is the first piece that says nope now the ironic part is we took this apart as a running engine it wasn't the best running of engines but someone had rebuilt it since that failure so this connecting rod's not even from this engine but they usually fail in such a predictable manner that you can line all the witness marks on this rod to the witness marks in that engine and it still tells the story. So we have the heavy crease right there where it would have hit the bottom of that cylinder wall. We have kind of a um, uh, softened sharp edge right there where it slammed into the crankcase bottom. And then we have a shiny spot here where the crankshaft came around and you know pinched it right down hard. So we'll just align all the marks real quick. So you can see where the old rod knocked the chunk out of the cylinder wall and then it also came to rest against the floor of the crankcase right before the crankshaft came around and smack came to an abrupt stop and further drilled that down into that cast. And it must have been a heck of a hit as well because you can even see it on the back side. You can see the cracking and stuff. It's kind of almost spider webbing out from there. Yeah, it, it pounded that down pretty good. So. You can check it with the straight edge of this rule. See, we're nice and flat there, but we get on we get on that crack spot. You can see how far that actually pushed through, but that's inconsequential because of the base gasket on these. I'll just line this old one in real quick. Everything around that crack is completely sealed against the top of the bell housing. So you could knock the whole floor of this crankcase out. It still wouldn't matter. It's all just going to be uh, caught inside that gasket. So even if we do have any seepage through that crack, not gonna matter. Similar situation with the notch that's been taken out of the bottom of that cylinder wall. You don't have any rings that come back this far anyhow, so it kind of doesn't matter. But even if you did, all you have to do is chamfer all of the sharp edges around that notch. As long as you don't have any sharp 90 degree corners, it can't catch a ring. It can't catch the skirt of the piston. You can have, just like in a two cycle engine, you could have the piston and rings going past that all day long. It's not going to be an issue, so we leave that notch there. We don't worry about it. Those things aside, what finally sealed the deal to me to turn this into a test subject, and I get you guys in here so you can see, is, I don't know, we can get the light just right, that crack that goes right off the end of the pencil right through there. Can you see it? When I move away, it's just a faint, faint line right now, but when we press a bearing in there, it's gonna open up just a bit and be more noticeable. 
that's not really atypical on these. You do see them from time to time, and it goes into that retaining dowel bore right there. So once you press a bearing in and then it opens up even more, you're guaranteed that the old straight dowel is not going to ever stay tight. That's not a big deal. We'll put one of those in there. So that pretty much negates that. So because the outside eighth inch or so of this bore is compromised with that crack in there, it's not gonna be a super tight press fit out there anyhow. This is the perfect candidate for me to go in with my boring bar. You can see I've already got the sleeve adapter set in the rear cover. We have the other one ready to go in that seal bore. We can come in and scallop out some of the material around the inside of that bearing bore to, uh, to accommodate the rework that I wanna try and do. And the sleeve adapter in the rear cover, you can see I've got it set out. That's because you remember when I built this, I put those two threaded holes in there, one to the outside, one to the inside. We're using the outer one with the machine screw, and that also opens us up to the front of the bearing bore in this cover so we can scallop some material out of that as well. So that's about all I can really explain to you right now until I actually get this set on the lathe and I get the material pulled out of both of those spots that I want to do. So why are we pulling material out? Well, we're working on a crankshaft end thrust rework there, and as you can see from the other short blocks we put together, there's not a lot of surplus room to work with in there. So we pretty much have to make it wherever we can find it. So my modification is going to take the end thrust that's being applied to just this front main bearing that tries to pull it in and push it out and split it in half. So I'm taking the end thrust that's trying to pull this front main bearing in and I'm transferring it to the rear main bearing. So each main bearing will only have crank thrust that's trying to force it outward. And we're gonna remove the inward pull off of this skinny little poor front main. So that should be a much more stable in thrust arrangement than what came on this from the factory. And I know even though these are hollow journal cranks on the rods, I know of other people that have split the thrust evenly between front main, rear main. And so far they've held up just fine. We haven't had any cracking or breakage or anything like that going on. So let's get this set on the big shepherd gap bed. I'll get the boring bar and everything recentered in here. We'll get the bit set. We'll scallop out some material and hopefully after that you'll see a little bit better what I'm trying to accomplish. Okay, we're set back up on the shepherd lathe and if you hear some noise in the background, there's Senior. He hasn't been on the channel for a while. He stays busy out here working on uh, tracked creatures, tracked horses of a different color, right? So. Yeah. I've got the cutter bit set in here, and what I've done, I've set it, this light's horrible, I know, but I've set it so that I can take a 3 30 seconds deep cut out of the leading edge of this bearing bar here, and we're only going in 3 30 seconds of an inch as well. We're just cutting out a square channel at the front of that, and I've just been playing around with it, just, you know, rotating the lathe by hand, and it's already been cutting out a really good uh, channel so there's been some really good chips coming off that cutter bit so I don't think I'm even gonna turn the motor on I might just feed this entirely by hand it's a lot more controllable and I'd like to do this cut in one pass so I'm not having to do a smaller diameter cut and then jumping out to a larger seeing as how I've got it set where I want it we're just gonna see if we can chew in by hand and see how far we can go I put a fresh edge on that bit, not only down the side of it, but on the tip as well. And you can see it's really curling out some good sized chips. All right, we should be at proper depth. Yeah, we've got a nice square channel cut all around the top end of that bearing bar. So to do the final measurement, I'm gonna have to 
take the rear cover off and get in here and actually be able to get, get a good depth read on it. So just get that handled real quick. Yeah, we're gonna call that good. All right, I took the bar out and I flipped the block around in the lathe because we want to cut in this direction for that rear cover again. And I didn't alter the position of the bit in the bar because this is not a really accurate one with a pusher screw on the back for fine tuning or repeatable settings. So I wanted to keep that where it was so we have some uniformity between the step we cut here and the step we're about to cut in the rear cover. So I'll reassemble this in the block and we'll get, get to cutting again. Okay, everybody, we're set up again. Same operation on this end, only we're not so limited on depth that we can go in over here because, you know, we have such tight tolerances we're working with here for the dowel holes and the oil holes and everything. We can only go in a very little ways. Over here, we've got probably three-eighths of an inch before we even start flirting with where that machine screw is through that hole. So we can make a little bit more robust of a cut on this side. Okay, have a better look at that. Get the shavings out of there. Chips, I should say, chips. Yeah, I'm thinking that looks, that looks like about where I wanted to be right there. So, like I said, this side's a lot less critical for depth. Eyeball's good enough. You know, it's kind of fun making like other people's eyelids twitch for a change, right? <laughs> back from the shepherd lathe now. So we've got our steps cut into the rear cover and into the block. And the reason why we cut those, well, let's look at the original design for the crankshaft bearings. And each one was just a straight through sleeve. All the thrust was contained, of course, on the front main between this web and the gear with the seal washer. To split it, I'm gonna make two new bearings, each one that has a thrust flange on the inside edge. So we're gonna take this front main, we're gonna stop it just short of that seal washer back there so it's not even coming into play anymore. And our thrust face is going to bear up against this web right here. We'll add the thrust face to the rear main that will bear up against this web here. All of our end play shall be contained between those two points and those new flanges on the new bearings are going to reside in these steps that we cut in the cover and in the block. Looking once again at how we had to cut those steps, this front main really illustrates how little room we have to work with because we had to halt at 330 seconds in because anymore we'd start getting into that larger 3 8 diameter step land that's up at the top of this center dowel hole right here and we didn't want to do that. So yeah, 330 seconds out for a cut and then 330 seconds depth. That's really about all you can afford right there. That still gives us an eighth inch wide flange on our bearing to have a little bit sticking out past. So I believe that's gonna be sufficient. And looking very closely at the contour of the step right here, you can see around the inside, I had to put a 45 degree bevel edge on there that's about a 30 second wide because with this accompanying sketch, we could not leave it as a square stepped corner like that. You can see this dotted line. I did cut just a 45 degree chamfer on that just to take the point off of that transition because when I make the new bearing, if I flanged it out and left the inside of that transition at 90 degrees, stresses always center on inside corners right down at the point and that's where cracking would start. Any kind of forces that are applied to that flange are all gonna zero right there and you start having problems. So here's a cutaway. This is the block up here with our 45 degree chamfer we put on the edge. And what I'll have to do is on the new aluminum bearing, I will do an arced 
a curved radius the transitions from straight up to vertical right there and what that does it spreads all those forces out evenly they don't concentrate down in one spot like they would in that square corner and you avoid your cracking there so that 45 degree chamfer gives me room for my radius so hopefully all that makes sense next step dig out some bearings All right, just finished drilling the two oil holes in the bearing, so it's time for a quick deburr. This aluminum's so soft that I just do this by hand. That's about all you gotta do. All right, we can start cutting the oil channel inside now. All right, we're set in the milling machine. I have the key seat cutter in there. We're about to bridge the, uh, the oil channel between those two holes in the bearing and yeah we're not even gonna be turning the machine on see that not even plugged in so yeah we're gonna wuss out but we're gonna spin that thing just like this manual machining in the most literal sense of the phrase so yep that key seat cutter is so sharp and that aluminum so soft that's all you have to do And with that, I've got both of the bearings made. So that was a few minutes spent in front of the lathe, but I think we're gonna be all right. Like I said, we got that flange up there at the top and everything has been drilled and channeled on the inside so far, just like the factory originals. And I even decided to cut a 30,000 steep oil groove at the bottom on each one of them. I don't think this flange was gonna have any trouble finding oil knowing how everything pumps around inside those crankcases, but I just wanted to give it just a little bit of surplus to be sure, so. And they're a good fit on the crankshaft. So with double thrust bearings, we don't have to worry about this one having to take the entire load of it all, and neither one of these bearings are gonna be able to move outward in operation anyhow, because the crankshaft is gonna be continually bouncing between the two, forcing each one further out, but neither one can go further out because the flange is gonna be bottomed in the pockets, in the steps that we machined, in the cover and in the blocks. So it should be pretty darn stable. So yeah, just don't allow the bearings a place to go and they should stay right where you set them. So that's my idea. Pressed in now. I didn't think you needed to see this. You've already watched me do it twice, but yeah, we have oil holes lined up. That's, yep, good there and there. 
and you can see the thrust face sticks just proud of the block surface and just proud of let's get a good sideways view see that yep i think you can pick it up it's it's the high point it sticks out past the the snout of the rear cover too and once again oil holes lined in there and there everything's all good and as usual before we dowel these and make them permanent i want to set the crank in get the end play figured out all right, crankshaft is set in and I've got assembly grease on all of the critical areas so we're good to slide things together. And setting the crankshaft in play with this system I think is actually gonna be pretty simple. You just shim this rear cover out or in to get your desired end float on the crankshaft. And according to my measurements, so all right, we've got about 60 thousandths worth of gasket material between these two pieces right here. We're just gonna stack these in like shims for now. I'm not saying this is what we're gonna go with. But remember, we're prototyping things here, so we're just trying to establish how well this is going to work. So the 60 thousandths worth of gasket material should leave us with some in play on the crankshaft. We're probably gonna be a little tight yet, but we shouldn't be bound. Okay, just as I suspected, we do have in play. We're a little bit tight. We've only got three thousandths. So I think, okay, 10 to 15 is desired end clearance spec, max 25. So if I had a 10 thousandths thick shim to put between gasket A and gasket B, that's going to take us out to 13. And after the gaskets are clamped, with all of the load from the bolts for a while, they are going to compress in a few more thousandths that would probably still bring us down to 10 thousandths, 12 thousandths range. I think we've got a pretty workable system here. Good spin on the crank, nice and smooth, no scraping. So, all right, I'm satisfied. Might as well dowel these bearings in place, make them permanent. All right, everybody, let's find a way to wrap this up. I can tell we're dragging on, but yeah, we've broached the final oil channels in the bearings and we have the threaded dowel in that one, threaded dowel in this one. I think I can get you up there and see, yep, there's the oil channel in there. So all that stuff is permanent. And finally, we should be done with the line boring tools and the broaching bushing. And it was a lot of work and a lot of hours getting all this stuff set and getting it made and getting it to work but it's all about making the tools that make the job. So it's definitely worth the investment in the long run. And I really like how that bearing sets in this one. Um, we have about 30 thousandths protrusion. That was what I was shooting for. We've got a little more on this one. We got about 60 thousandths here, but I didn't want to have to go thinner than an eighth inch flange. And we just can't cut in very far at all because we're so close to that hole. And it's all a compromise, all right? There's no ideal set up with these. Everything you do is going to be a compromise in one area or another. But I believe we have a workable system with an improved end thrust for this crankshaft. McMaster car is going to be getting another order for me tonight because I want to put a good 10,000 steel shim between those two gaskets. And as long as I'm buying shim stock, we might get a roll of 5,000s as well for future projects. And all right, I'm going to start throwing the short block together. You guys have basically already seen me do two of them, so I don't know how much of this I'm going to show. But, yeah, we've got one more good set of reconditioned rods with new pins and bushings. We've got our used but still good 20 over pistons. We have a whole stack of 20 over compression and oil control rings brand new. And we have another set of 20 under rod bearings. I was going to say rod mains. I'm, it's <laughs> We're getting tired. New set of 20 under rod bearings for those uh, rods and journals and everything else. So... Yeah, that's um, 
Man, this was that was a long time coming getting to this point, but a lot of work went into this episode, a lot of hours, more on this one than any that I've done so far. But we'll see how those improved thrust bearings work. Maybe they're not improved, but it'll run till it doesn't. I'll guarantee that much. So and I thank you guys for sticking with me through all of these gritty details. I know some of it can get a little bit dull and dry and boring sometimes, but you know, I've said this to other people before, I'll say it again. I've, the best piece of advice I've ever got from a fellow YouTuber was make, create, I should say, create the type of content that you want to see. And that's what I'm doing here because honestly, you know, I'm creating content for a 19 year old me that just bought his first old Caterpillar. It was beyond wore out and he had no idea where to start. I would have watched every second of build series like this where I could actually see what was going on inside these things before I dove into it and tried to do it myself. You know, YouTube wasn't around when I got my first D2 and there was just, I had to learn all this stuff by myself. Senior was never into cats. Uh, my grandpa had that old D2 for a while, but he was he was a carpenter logger. He never really did mechanic stuff. So I put in a lot of hard yards trying to figure all this stuff out for myself and I spent a lot of money in the process and I I spent a lot of time and I made a lot of mistakes. So yeah, some people don't like all of this in-depth technical stuff, but I, you know, I can assure you we're getting to the end of it. But yeah, that's why we built, or I said, I should say we're trying to build three of these when we only really needed this one right here. But I wanted to cover all the bases while I was into it. Yeah, here's your ideal world scenario rebuild. Here's your spun front main scenario rebuild, which is common. And here's what I would have liked to have done from the start so yeah i just wanted to cover all those bases as long as i was in the you know the frame of mind and we had everything out and ready to go so i've again talked for way too long but thanks for watching everybody i'm going to start throwing that short block together i'll bring you back when we're about ready to wrap all that up and then we'll uh we'll continue on we're about ready to put the tri build to bed i think uh i think we got something here so thanks again everybody